Welcome to Dodgers Daily. Casey Porter here. So glad that you decided to tune in. Fans, we have a very, very, very special guest today. Right-handed pitcher in the Dodgers organization. Ben Kasparius joins Dodgers Daily for the second time. I've had a chance to talk to you on a couple of other occasions about some of the things that you were trying to adjust over last season. So, Ben, I am so excited to talk to you today. Yeah, absolutely, Casey. Thanks for having me. Okay, before we talk about you, got to talk about your girlfriend, Aaron Matson, the field hockey coach at North Carolina. They won the national championship in overtime in a shootout. I know that was a big deal to all you guys to yeah. so talk all about that. Yeah, no, it was, um, it was one of those experiences that was pretty cool just being so close to it as I was. Um, I had just finished up in the fall league, so pretty much right when I thought things were going to kind of toned down for a little bit. I kind of just jumped right into that fire. I got to Chapel Hill, I think it was November 8th or 9th, and they were just starting the Elite Eight. They hosted the tournament this year too, so it was awesome. Fans, everything, it was obviously home court advantage for them, but it was really cool. She had taken the job, I think it was January 31st of this year. Feels like it's been longer, but um, it was a cool adjustment for her just, you know, after winning four Natties as a player to do it as, you know, as a coach for her first year was pretty special and it was awesome to be there for her and to witness that. So, and it's been a whirlwind ever since pretty much for her just with um, interviews and, you know, people coming at her for, you know, everything you could possibly imagine in terms of, you know, maximizing what she can do off the field. So it's been, it's been cool to follow along with that and just kind of see, you know, where her career off the field is going to take her. So I've had a chance to communicate with you enough to know just exactly how proud of her you have been. So that is super, yeah. super cool. Okay, so starting this year, let's get back to your season this year. Yeah. And you made, hey, you made a lot of great adjustments, and we're going to get into it. You started at Great Lakes. Your first two months, you had ERAs that were below two. I mean, you were just absolutely on fire. Everything seemed like everything you threw to home plate landed in the strike zone, and everything just went perfect with the, for you earlier in this season. So talk about the start you got off to there at Great Lakes. Yeah, no, definitely. I think, you know, coming back to Great Lakes, I was pretty confident with the layout with, um, you know, what things looked like within the league. And I have to give a lot of credit to, you know, the development that the Dodgers do, especially in spring training, just getting ready for the season. I felt as prepared, as confident in my arsenal, my repertoire, and just like where I was mentally in terms of being, you know, a pitcher that can take on a role starting and taking down innings. And, I was ready from the get-go. Um, I think a lot of that had to do, too, with the work I had put in, you know, October until about January, and then when I obviously got back to the complex. So for me and for the beginning of the season, it was really awesome just to, you know, you know, kick off the way I did um, and just propel that through the year. So it was great. I always warn people, the minor leagues, you just can't look at statistics it's always yeah. about the process because these guys, sure. as they get into the system, they're always working on this and they're always working on that. And they're trying to just expand their horizon, if you will, and, and just see just, yeah. how, just how good can I get before I get to the major leagues, right? And then you're trying yeah. to do all those things against professional hitters. So it's, it's you, just, you just have to look at the process and you can't look at, at just strictly results. So talk about when you came up to AA Tulsa, Talk about some of the adjustments you made. And, boy, I'll tell you what, it seemed like you unlocked a lot of velo. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, you kind of took the words right out of my mouth. But for me, I think the biggest mental adjustment I made from my first year was just realizing, like, hey, you know, numbers are going to say a certain thing on paper. But if you go out there with a certain objective, whether it's a bullpen session and, and like, and, you know, I'll touch on a little more, obviously, but there was so much work that went into what was going on with my arsenal and, you know, how we were going to attack lineups and navigate through a lineup. But that's the whole thing. It's all process oriented. It's, hey, how can I use this pitch a little bit better? So there were certain games where it was, hey, I'm going to be really precise with my fastball or I'm going to, you know, fastball needs to be in zone above 55% and stuff like that. So I, I kind of, and I kind of started realizing that, you know, you're going to, there's going to be, days where things are great and then it's like okay this wasn't great so let's get this here and here and just it's a building block of what really makes guys big league pitchers so and i realized that pretty early on in my time in double because i will say in terms of the promotions i think the biggest jump was definitely high a to double a mm -hmm. rather than low a to high which i still think is a obviously a substantial jump i just think that the level of competition in double a is definitely a, a big jump from high a and i i, I learned that pretty quickly 
No doubt about that. And you went periods of time, long periods of time, sometimes to where literally, I mean, I've seen you pitch quite a bit at this point, going all the way back to UConn, where you were pitching better than you ever have. Your ball was hotter. Your ball was moving more. It was in the strike zone more. But simply put, it just wasn't getting put in the statistics the way that you actually were throwing the ball. Was that frustrating to you? Um, It is. And I think that's where, again, like the mental growth of just, you know, we're on the right path. Um, Back to the point about the velo, I think – I want to say last year, I think average fastball was 93.2 or in the low, like the low 93s. And this year it was on average, I think 94. And then the last month of the season, I think it was above 95. So that's something that we were really taking a look at a deep dive, like, Hey, you know what? Like Velo just, it's, it is how it is. It helps your stuff play. The harder you throw, the harder it is for guys to make adjustments. And that's obviously going to make my, my off speed stuff, which is my bread and butter better. So That was a big step up for me. And now it's, hey, like, when do we throw this? When do we throw that? You know, I added the curveball. I know that's one of the big steps I took in double A. Just, you know, when are we going to use the curveball? It was only one of the – it was a pitch this year where I think I was getting swings 10% of the time. So, in that case, it's really important for me to land it in the zone. And that developed and got better and better. And that was a big piece to the success I was was having the last month and a half or two months of the season. And then in stints in the fall league as well. So – it's just a learning game. It's it's figuring out when to do what and, you know, taking a deep dive into the hitters and seeing, you know, how I can use my stuff to the best of my ability and to obviously, you know, disrupt what the guys are trying to do at the plate. What exactly was your mix that you ended up with? Did you have the fastball, curveball, slider yeah. change? Is that right? Yeah. Um, we and That was another thing, too. When I got to double-A, it was kind of more consolidating the slider profile. So instead of a range from 82 to, you know, 89, 90 at times. Like how can we get the floor being, you know, ideally 85, 86, 85 on the low end. So just kind of making it a little bit tighter, a little bit better for in zone usage rather than swing and miss out of the zone. And then obviously kind of just play with it and see what I can do against certain hitters and what they're seeing. So that was a, that was a big deal as well. You mentioned that you sat 95 ish towards the end of the year. You touched yep. 98. I had you at 97 yeah. a little bit earlier, so obviously you locked, unlocked something that, that allowed you just to continue to climb that velo chain, didn't you? Yeah, and I think it's a part of it is just trusting the coaching staff. I mean, they, I mean, you know how it is. We pump out guys that are throwing upper 90s all the time. It's something that, you know, buy into the process, you know, be willing to learn, be willing to try different things in the middle of the week, even if the start is in two days or so. So I think just, you know, being able to absorb information and then just obviously just, you know, trial and error and bullpens and see where it takes you. And I think the sky's the limit being a Dodger in terms of how hard you can throw. And that's obviously around the board. It's going to make you a better pitcher. Ryan Dinnick and and uh, Ryan Dinnick was your pitching coach there. And then also during yeah. the linger, the two pitching coach system, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, they're um, they're both really special guys. Um and for me, my relationship with both of them was, was great. It was, you know, we're not going to blow sunshine, but we're going to get after it every single week. And it was productive every single day of the week. Start day, there was a plan. And I was, I was regardless of the result, I was prepared. And it was, it was due to them and the, the amount of work that they put in throughout the whole year. And I was really, um, I had a great time with both of them. And One thing them. I noticed about you that I was totally impressed with, Ben, you worked a lot harder, it seemed like, on your days that you didn't pitch than on, than on your actual game days. Yeah, um, and I think that's a testament to just being able to be durable. I think I, I take, at least I take a lot of pride in that. After, after the season, I probably logged close to 125 or 130 innings, and then with spring training on top of that, that's kind of what propels you into those situations and feeling good late, late on into August and September. And then for in this in this year, obviously October and November too. So that's I, I just think around the board, that's what needs to be done just in order to feel good because you're not going to every single day. But I think as long as you are on a program and sticking to what you need to do, it's gonna help you in the long run to make sure that you compile like a good amount of starts that you do feel good. No doubt. And another thing that you really started doing really well, you've always done this very well. But I thought you really just got better and better and better at this. You pitched backwards. I mean, you had three yeah. or four performances to where, I mean, you were getting ahead in the zone with curveballs and sliders and changeups. And I mean, you were, although you could reach back and get the velo, you were really yeah. pitching guys backwards. So I thought that was a lot of growth for you, too. For sure. And, you know, for me, it's 
my fastball is not my best pitch metrically, and it's something in terms of adjustments, that's what I'm working on now is just creating a little bit more deception within the delivery, whether it's dropping my release height or, you know, and just getting into my back leg a little bit more to create a plane that's going to allow my fastball to play a little bit better up in the zone. Um, so for me, it's like if I'm going to have success, I need to be able to go in, in the zone and out of the zone with my off-speed stuff and just keep guys guessing. That's really that's really the name of it. You don't want to create kind of a pattern of, oh, I can, I can really jump on this pitch because I know it's coming and just be able to just navigate again, like through a lineup and maybe back, back pocket something that you want to throw and wait until, you know, the fourth or fifth or sixth inning and just, you know, just pitching and just that's the name of the game is just filling it up with everything and, you know, keep them, keep them honest. One thing I hear a lot from pitchers, especially from that high A to double A transition that you mentioned is that they get more selective. So you might have dirty yeah. off-speed stuff like you do. I mean, there, nobody has better off-speed stuff as far as the way that it breaks, the tight movement, the late movement that you get on it. But then again, again, as you as you get in the upper ranks, they stop swinging at it. So now you actually yeah. have to throw it in the strike zone. Has that been a big transition for you? I think that's probably the biggest transition in terms of just guys are more selective. Their strikeout rates are going to cut down because everybody in, everybody in high is a really good player, right? So whether it's a guy who's going to hit 300 or if it's a guy that's going to hit home runs. But what makes you, I think, at least in my opinion, what makes you a double-A hitter outside of a high hitter is just like your approach in general. It's just, what am I going up there to do? And they never really deviate from that plan. So I remember earlier on when I was in double-A, I was throwing good pitches out of the zone with two strikes. And I'm like, man, like, how are you not swinging at that? And that's really, that's really what, that's really what the game is, is like you're put, making a good pitch and, there's times they're not going to swing at it. So it's like you got to just keep your foot on the gas and keep making good pitches because they will jump on mistakes too. So, so yeah, definitely. That was their, their approaches at the plate were like significantly more impactful. I would, I would say from team to team. This Dodgers organization has just an absolute ton of like 25 year oldish. I believe you're 24, correct, Ben? 24. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Really just great right-handed starting pitching arms at this point. So, how yeah. do you handle the competition? I know you guys are all really good buddies, but how do you handle yeah. the competition and knowing there's so much talent in the pitching ranks for the Dodgers right now? Yeah, I mean, I think it's I, I think it's a it's a blessing and a curse, right? So it's you're you're getting developed to the full of your potential, and then if you really buy in, you're going to see just incredible, incredible growth. But they've also created such a great culture where you know everybody's buying in, and that's something that's you know top to bottom. We have the best staff, you know, I think, in baseball. I think no no doubt about it, especially from just who I've talked to and other team, other teams and guys and everything like that. So it's a fun, I, I don't look at it as a competition. I look at it as like, we're all on this journey together. We're having a good time. Everybody's super, super, super talented. And I mean, being on that staff, I, it was every single day. It was, you know, this guy's going to pitch in the big leagues. Like I'm watching a future big leaguer run out to, you know, for the first inning and it, it's, it's special. It's, it's really cool. And I think everybody works really hard. And again, like I'm, those are all my buddies. So I'm pulling for every single one of those guys. When Kyle made his debut, Emmett made his debut. Like it was just like pure joy for those guys. And I mean, those are just two examples, but those guys work so hard too, where it's just like, it's super awesome in terms of that, just being able to see what they do day to day and, you know, whether it's joking around in the locker room or the dugout or just, you know, working through catch play on the field and talking about grips and stuff like it's we're all in it together at the end of the day. So it's the competition's great. I know everybody wants to selfishly pitch in the big leagues, but it's really rewarding to see like one of your close buddies get up there, too. No doubt about that. And hey, how about this? You got to pitch to Diego Cartaya, Hamlet Marte. Yeah. Um, I believe Vladimir Chalo came up for a while. Yep. But another guy, Carson Taylor, man. I was so happy yeah. for him to go to the Phillies. Another position of strength. There's a million great catchers in this Dodgers organization. Yeah, there is. So to see him go to the Phillies and get a, an opportunity, maybe an organization that doesn't have, you know, just one catcher after the other, I was super excited for Carson. Oh, for sure. I mean, CT's a great dude. Um, it was fun, you know, especially the pitcher catcher battery. Like we're talking about the game multiple times throughout a game or just throughout the week and just kind of what we're seeing in terms of like getting, if I lined up with him that week, just getting ready for games and stuff like that. And I'm super happy for him. He's going to, he's going to get a good shot. And, you know, if he keeps doing what he's doing, he's going to be in the big leagues for sure. 
one of the things I think I have respected about you the most from the time your time all the way back to North Carolina to UConn to all the times that I've seen you with the Dodgers is that you want to compete against the best. You want to be around the best. You want to be on the best teams. You want to compete against the highest of competitions. So I know you had to have been fired up when you found out that you were going to the Arizona Fall League. And then that was probably a great experience for you because other those are some of the best young hitters in the entire game of baseball. So that's a super awesome challenge for you. So I know that had to be a really good experience for you. It was it was so awesome. It was one of those things where like, you know, subconsciously I was, and I, you, you knew, you knew that I caught steam a little bit the last month and a half of the season. Um, you know, the curveball was there, mm-hmm. the fastball velo was ticking up. I was throwing it in better spots in zone. And it was, it was one of those things where like, I was like, man, I wish I had, you know, four or five more starts at this thing. Cause I feel like I'm really picking it up. And luckily enough, I was invited to the fall league and it was just such a great experience. Not only just, in terms of baseball and on the field, but just, you know, one being around the guys that we are with, with the Dodgers organization is five or six, just awesome dudes. And then obviously DA, who's just, you know, one of the best in the business, truly just such a great guy. And then I think it was the, I've, I've talked to my parents, friends, everything because they've asked about the experience. I think the biggest thing was probably just the validation piece. Mm -hmm. Like, Hey, we know everybody one through nine is, is an elite hitter, is an elite infielder, outfielder, whatever it is. So to go out there and, you know, because I was up, I did have some up and downs there. There were some great outings. There were some ones where I was struggling to get through an inning. But the validation piece of, all oh, I can get out to this level, that's probably the biggest thing I took away from it and just being able to pitch that deep into the season and, you know, be as consistent as possible in that time. That was pretty huge for me too. So it was it – was, it was really great. It was an awesome experience, and it was it was some some really really good talent throughout the entire league, which was awesome. What I'm hearing in your voice, what I heard in your voice every time I had a chance to talk to you at Tulsa, is that you feel like there is an incredible amount of momentum that you're carrying into this off season. Would that be correct? For sure. Yeah, and I think you know everybody's going to struggle. Everybody's going to you know have those have those times where it's like man, nothing's clicking or you know, you have one of those days where everything does click and it's, it's like, that's baseball. That's kind of how it is. And I don't think I would be doing myself any, any favors by just going into next year without a game plan. So taking what things that did go really well, and then obviously like chipping away at what I need to improve on. That's kind of where I'm going. And that's really my goal for the next, for the next season. So guys get to double A and they build their arsenals, they build their pitch mixes, and they get on top of their pitch mixes like you are right yeah. now. I mean, point blank, when you release your fastball the way that you like, when you release your curveball, your change up, your slider, the way that you like at this point, you're throwing it better than you ever have. So the key now, I would assume, is going to be consistency. Now, from here on out, it's build to be as consistent as you can. Would that be correct? Yeah, I would say I would say there's a consistency factor for sure. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to – unless you're one of like three or four guys in the big leagues where it's you're almost unhittable every single time, you have to be at a level of – or have a level of focus that's just unprecedented at every at every moment you're on the field because the minute you, you lose that, it's going to – you know it. Um, and I think, again, too, is just, you know, the more I'm learning about hitters and their and kind of what they're doing and trying to do and, you know, the scouting report going into every week, I could be a little bit more on top of that in terms of just like deep diving and count by count and stuff like that. And again, just how my own arsenal works. That's kind of, that's kind of the name of it. And, you know, there's guys that are just classic. They know what they're doing with two strikes. So they know, Oh, Oh, and then there's guys in lineups where it's like, all right, I'm facing this guy for the third time. He's a really good hitter. What do I need to pull out of the back pocket? Like I said, and just and just make sure like I get through that clean inning again to go deep into a game. So, so yeah. Tell us about your off season. Where are you at? What are you doing? All those things. Yeah. So, I finished up the fall league uh, early November. I was kind of in the the Chapel Hill whirlwind with my girlfriend, just experiencing you know everything that she's been doing. It's been awesome. She deserves it all. Um, so just bouncing around there. Um, going on vacation tomorrow for a few days just to recharge a little bit with my family. And I'm in Connecticut right now, but I've been pretty much bouncing back and forth from Connecticut and North Carolina. All right. Very good. Yeah. Hey, Ben, you yeah. ready to answer some fun questions? Yeah, let's do it. Yep. Okay. Fun question number one. You went to UConn. Of course, you went to North Carolina, but then you yep. went to UConn, went back home. You grew up in the, the state of Connecticut. So you went back and played for Coach Penders. 
Okay, so there's been some talk that UConn might join the Big 12. Of course, there's all sorts yeah. of talk with different different yeah, realignments yeah. here or there. Okay, if you're pitching for UConn, to jo- for the Big 12 to take UConn, what's your pitch for them? I mean, in, in terms of what they've done, as small of a state Connecticut is up in the Northeast, I think – it would be extremely beneficial. I mean, you've seen what their basketball team has done. Their baseball team's a top 20 program year in, year out. You know, I think I saw something today too. They're one of like nine teams to win a, to win a regional game in the last five years. So like they're a contender every single year. Um, And just in terms of the fans too, like they're into it. It's a, it's a great school, great culture. And I think, I think for notoriously football players in the state of Connecticut who are getting these big offers to go play at other schools. They're taking them. I think being in the Big 12 in that conference just speaks for itself in terms of football, too. So I think it would only make our football program better, especially with uh, Coach Mora there and what he's been able to do the last couple of years. So I think it would be pretty cool. I I mean, obviously, I heard some rumblings about them in the ACC and this and that, but – you never. It's you. you have, I have no idea where it's going to go. It's there's just some craziness right now. So we'll see. But they're they could be lined up with any conference in the country. I think they would do well with with how well they do things over there. They're in the Big East right now. Big East has sneaky good baseball. There's a lot of good pitching. Sneaky year. Yep. Yeah, a lot of good. Okay, so let's get back to your girlfriend, Erin Matson. Yeah. She was actually voted by the ACC Network as a top ten athlete in the history of the ACC con- uh, conference. Yeah. She has she is the all time leading goal scorer at, at the University of North Carolina, which is incredible. She's a four time national champion. She's the head coach there. So I got to ask you, okay, you're a professional athlete and maybe the best organization of all sports. Erin Matson, Ben Kasparius, who's the best athlete? I got to go with her. I've seen uh, her. I mean, she, she's, she's, she, I mean, I've told a lot of people this, but I think she might be the be- one of the best athletes I've ever met in my life. And t- top to bottom, men or women, like we pick, she'll pick up a golf stick. She'll hit a ball, pipe a ball, 200 yards straight. Like she can, she's just, she's a gifted athlete. I I, I really mean that. So I've got to take her. I, uh, yeah, I got to go. I got to go with Aaron on that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, man. You went to North Carolina out of high school, we mentioned, then you came back yeah. home to UConn. You were super excited about getting to come back home and play for Coach Penders. It was right yeah. after they actually came to Oklahoma and played at the Bricktown Ballpark and almost yeah. beat Oklahoma. That was the most awesome team. Still, I, I still talk about that UConn team, yeah. just how scrappy and just how they fought. And Coach Penders and just his mentality was just so fun to watch. I can remember that team. Matter of fact, I went over and actually congratulated every one of the UConn players after that last game because I was so impressed. And I can't remember who the best player was, but he actually made AAA that following summer. I was on the grounds crew. I got to see him again. But, okay, so you got to go back and play for Coach Penders. Yeah. So if you could give one compliment to Coach Penders back to him if he's watching this, what would it be? Oh, there's a lot I want to say right now. I would say that he just he just has a fire in him that translates to his players like no like pretty much nobody I've ever met before and I think like you said just how scrappy everybody is and how hard everybody plays that's just UConn baseball that's his brand I think there's no question why I think they're entering their 12th year as a as with coach Mack and pitching coach and coach Horgan I think it's the longest tendered D1 staff in baseball and I and and that doesn't surprise me one bit and like their loyalty and just what they can do and turn a program into just a powerhouse every year is something pretty, pretty special. So I, I just think the culture that he creates is just unmatched. And I'm lucky too, just being with the Dodgers organization, it's very similar in terms of what they preach and UConn without a doubt, like are they prepared me to take on pro ball to the fullest for sure. I tell everybody that will listen and I'm a big college baseball fan. UConn is easily the most underrated program in the United States of America every Definitely. single year in college baseball. Yeah, and, and and it's no surprise to me at all with all the work they put in, how much work the players put in. Again, like it comes down to the buy-in, just being showing up every single day, working hard, and that's just a testament to those guys and who they are as people and how much they care about the program. So they're great, um, and they'll they'll be a really special part of my life for the rest of my life too. I know you're very close with your family. So what is the one thing that you yeah. would say that you're mo- – there's a million of them, kind of like we talked about yeah, yeah. with Coach Penders. But what's, what's one thing that you could say that you're most appreciative with your with the way that you were raised? Um, yeah, I, I would say if I had to put it in terms of sports, I think 
like I definitely had a spotlight on myself like from a pretty young age just with I was just naturally pretty good at sports and then with, with baseball picking up I think the biggest and most important thing was just how kind of laid back they were so you know baseball was at the baseball field home it was never an intensity that you know burned me out or did anything it was just genuine joy for me and I think just genuine support without any feelings involved or getting too intense or kind of putting any 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 sort of pressure on me at all and I honestly don't think I could ever thank them enough for that because home was a safe space for me to be able to just be myself and you know disconnect from kind of the attention I was getting when I was younger because that's that's a lot for somebody who is making noise in the baseball world, especially like you see these young guys in high school. It's a lot to take on, especially now in the social media era. I was lucky where like it wasn't a huge, huge thing when I was younger because it changes the game for sure. But I just think they're genuine support and like joy for me and love and just kind of letting me be, you know, be a high schooler, be a, be a teenager, but at the same time, like really just wanting what's best for me and, and not putting any pressure on me. Yeah, 2017 is when you graduated, right? Yeah. 2017 yep. Gatorade Player of the Year in the state of yep. Connecticut, an all-state shortstop. So, yeah, you talk about all that attention coming your way. That 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 can be kind of difficult to to navigate through. So it's it's great to have that support group, isn't it? For sure. Yeah, it was just a safe space that really just allowed me to, you know, be be the athlete I was and be you know who I was at the field, and and then just come home to a really just really just like easy, easy going, great family that just really just genuinely wanted me to be happy and have success in whatever I wanted. All right, here's one we didn't prepare for. So I think you're going to yeah. be okay with it. Okay. So, you know, we see a lot of times position players have to pitch, but yeah. if one of the pitchers on staff had to play shortstop, who would it be? Oh, River Ryan. Oh, River. No doubt. Okay. Oh, he's the, he's again, like <laughs> he might be a better athlete than Aaron. That that might that might have been a better question, but he um he's a freak. He really is. Like I would I would put him out at shortstop. I think any day of the week. Um, and I I know a lot of guys would definitely agree with me on that. But he could do it. He could definitely do it. You ever take ground balls back at shortstop? Take BP or anything like that? Oh, I haven't taken BP really, but I, I take ground balls as much as I can. I, I enjoy that. I think it's. And just, you know, especially when you're on the field, as, as much as we are every day, I think taking some ground balls and just being athletic and have some fun with the boys is, doesn't hurt at all. So we always try to we always try to sneak into the groups once in a while. So I'd yeah. be good with that till about July when it gets to be about 150 degrees. And I'd be like, no, yeah. thanks. <laughs> yeah, no, it turns into trying to stay inside for as long as possible and then <laughs> and then enter the sweat box. Yeah. No hey, so. did your folks get to come see you in Tulsa this summer? Yeah, they got out a couple of times, which was great. I mean, they're both working, so I know it's tough for them. But Tulsa is great. They have the airport right there. Mm-hmm. Again, like Midland was definitely a little bit more tricky with trying to get flights to Saginaw and figure out, you know, how to get a car from Detroit and everything like that. So Tulsa was – it wasn't too bad of a trip for them. They they were fortunate enough to get out there a couple of times, which is always great. Okay, so, last question. Let's finish yeah. on this one. What is the coolest thing that's ever happened to you on a baseball field? Oh, that's – that's tough. Um, I would say playing in the World Series was awesome. My freshman year at Carolina, that was really, really special. I think I went two for five. It was against that Oregon State team, too, mm-hmm. with Adley Rutschman, Nick Madrigal, Caden Grenier, Trevor Larnick. I think that's that's five first-rounders right there. And then, obviously, the pitching staff, but that was, was almost unbeatable. Um, but I was player of the game for that game. It was my first game back after breaking my foot in May. So it was like a month and a half removed from playing – kind of just got thrown into the fire and had a good game. So that was that was a pretty cool moment and probably the biggest, not the biggest stage, but definitely the most people I've played in front of. And then on top of that, I think my senior year of high school, my last at bat of the state championship was to break Bobby Valentine's hit record. So I was tied with him and my last at bat, I hit a double in the right center gap to break it. So that was pretty oh, wow. cool too because I – because I, I didn't know it at the time. I knew I was close and I was getting up there. And I had a hit earlier in the game and I didn't remember if it was to tie or to take the lead. So now looking back or actually right after the game, looking back and that being how it happened was pretty cool. So it was a little bit of, I think I, I think it was an RBI double. So it was a little insurance in the championship. So that was nice. a pretty cool moment as well. And then obviously just every time I get to put on a Dodger jersey, like when I got to play in the AFL, it's like a sense of pride and just – being able to put that jersey on every time is pretty priceless, honestly, every single time out. So 
pretty, there's been some good moments for sure. No doubt about it. And hey, the great thing about this, 24 years old, you're still very young. The best moments yep. hopefully are still yet to come, right? I hope so. That's the, that's the game plan. Stay healthy and just kind of just stay with the process that I've been on. And I think good things will happen for sure. Awesome deal. Hopefully get to see you in Oklahoma City. I, I get to travel a little bit. I'm, I'm closer to yeah. Oklahoma City than Tulsa. Hopefully it's a shorter trip for me this year to see you. Than, I know. And, and I hey, so. you know, there's been a, a double-A pitcher two years in a row. Michael Grove two years ago. Emmett yep. Sheehan, who went straight from double-A to the major league. So uh, who yeah. knows, right? We'll see what happens. Exactly. Exactly. All right, Ben. Hey, thank you so much for joining for the second time in Dodgers Daily, and best of luck. Absolutely, Casey. Thank you for having me. It's always a blast.